Well, weak and harder mind? Hmm? If so, maybe tonight's not your night to listen. In a moment, we'll be talking about the web bots, George Ure, Cliff High, on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Norrie. Tonight, we're going to talk about the future, your future, and some of your past as well, and some of all of our past. Two guests tonight, George Ure, business consultant, financial writer, publishing UrbanSurvival.com, IndependenceJournal.com, and PeopleNomics.com. He's an advisor and a consultant with Cliff High. Cliff, of course, has a patent on the computer-assisted reading technology, which allows reading from computer screens at up to 2,000 words per minute, reaching into other areas of hidden potential within language used by humans. He has been developing a system of software Internet agents, they're kind of like search engines, that uh, use proprietary processing methods to predict future events. The software project began 1997, capturing near real-time changes in language patterns within Internet discussions, then employing radical linguistic techniques of his own. He develops a model which anticipates future events with some seeming accuracy. Here they both are. Here's George. Here's Cliff. Hey, George, how are you? Top of the morning to you, George. Always things, a pleasure. Things are great out here in the East Texas outback. Super. And Glyph, how about you? Doing fine here in the Pacific Northwest. Great. It's a beautiful great. evening. Great to have you both back on the program. Let's. Uh, we'll talk about some of the past, and we'll look into the future over the next three hours that uh, we've got both of you. Lots of new listeners. They're saying, WebBots, what are they talking about? Are these little insects? What are they? So let's start with you, George. Just give us an overview of Cliff's work and what WebBot technology is. Well, the, the essence of the technology is back in 1997, Cliff began looking at future uh, developments of stock prices as it related to discussions on the Internet about various companies. The idea was to pick out some highs uh, in stock prices using language. However, as it evolved, it started uh, showing some indications about future events happening as well. And in uh, about June of 2001, Cliff and I started extensive correspondence, and uh, he, he sent me some notes that went to the effect, and, and you can still read it on the Urban Survival website archives, uh, saying that in the next 90 days from about June 1st of 2001, we would reach what was described as a tipping point, something with aspects of military and accident would occur that would forever change life as we know it. And following that, there would be other developments, such as restrictions on travel, and one thing led to another. Hmm. And I woke up the morning of, of 9-11 and went, holy smoke, yeah. this is a tipping point. Absolutely. And Cliff, when that happened, that tragic day, did you think back at what you were saying and predicting and interpreting? Um, I was rather shocked. No, I, my mind could not comprehend that um, that these two events, uh, the current event of 9-11 hasn't occurred, and our previous uh, posting on Georgia's site could possibly be connected. And then we started really examining it, and, and yeah, unfortunately, that was the case. Cliff, now, when you analyze the Internet chatter, tell me, I mean, what's going on out there in the Internet world? People are, are communicating with each other. They're chatting back and forth. How are you picking this up? Uh, basically, we operate on the theory that everybody is psychic at some level, and it kind of like leaks out of their uh, choice of language at any given moment. You might be discussing the making of bread pudding on a bread pudding forum, and for some reason you choose one set of words over another, and these words somehow leak out little bits of prescience when they're all gathered with everybody else's words that leak out little bits of the future. And your software finds these various uh, Internet sites? Correct. We have a seed list of about 300,000 forum. I hate that word. It's actually fora. In the plural. <laughs> yeah. uh, and as a linguist, this kind of stuff really upsets me, but <laughs> we'll let that pass. We have about 300,000 of these forums that we, that we visit, and those are seeds. And if there are links in there, our little agents, our software spiders, we call them, are free to follow those links out to a certain level. And every time they find one of our key word sets, they read all the words that are around it. And they bring all this back, and we kind of boil it down into a thick, syrupy mass and skim the stuff off the top. So like this economic mess that we're in, and I know when we all talked with both of you uh, months ago and even years ago, you were predicting an economic calamity. I mean, it's, it's on most, and I've gone back. I had Lex pull most of the things we've all talked about, 
And a lot of them talk about an economic mess, and I'll paraphrase that, and you were right on. So what were you picking up? I mean, what kinds of things did the software find in order to find this? We work at the level of archetypes, which is to say that all words are interrelated within a given language, and they have a tendency to spawn from one another, if you will. So you have an archetype at a very top level might be fear, and you would have other words that are associated with that, such as frightened, afraid, uh, shaky, so on and so on. And so we would collect all of these, and, and they would all essentially point towards fear. And so we start at the top and drill down. So we found a combination, insofar as the economic was concerned, of the archetypes of fear and familial or self uh, economic security. And it's not really economic, it goes to wealth, and it, but a lot of that kind of language is, is archaic, but nonetheless it is the, at the top level of the archetypes. So together what we did was to say, hmm, why are all these words around fear relating to economics, and why is there a lot of language that has what we call long-term values associated with it, emotional values? And these were words that were quasi-legalistic that shouldn't be in particular areas. And we have a tendency to think of slang at one level of, yeah. um, of immediacy and legal language at the other end. So at the time we first started picking up the economic problems, we were getting more legal language than we were slang. Now we're getting more slang than we are legal language, and thus the next uh, phase of the economic uh, downturn is almost upon us. I'm going to give you a, a kind of a strange example here, but it really points out at how what is going on that on the Internet allows your software to find these uh, both the you, George, and Cliff, a couple of weeks ago I was uh, at a restaurant in St. Louis talking to some of my friends there, and they were talking about how slow it was in the restaurant. And we were talking about, well, is it the economy? What is it? And I said, it's too hot outside. And when, it, when it's brutal in St. Louis, it's hot and it's muggy. And people tend, in mass, to react the same way. Which, And by that I mean one day... It's either very slow, the next day it could be packed, and nobody knows why. I happen to think, and I think your research would point this out, that the collective minds somehow are interconnected with each other, and people know in mass, I'm not going to go out tonight. It's, you know, I just, you know, it's too hot. I'm not going to go. And, the, and they all decide not to go out. Is that how your software works, Cliff? That's basically it, is that collective feeling expressing itself through these little bits of uh, language that leak out that are slightly out of the ordinary for that kind of a conversation. That's quite correct indeed. It is something, George, isn't it? Oh, yeah. In in fact, uh, to me, it's shocking sometimes. I was on uh, the day after New Year's prediction show uh, with Ian, and uh, one of the things that was in the forecast uh, in, in January of 2008, was we're going to have this terrible bump in the economy come along about October or so, and it will be equivalent to the bond crash in 1932. And then we were on in, gosh, I want to say late August, first part of September, with George Knapp and saying, okay, here it comes, looks like October 8th. And then in retrospect, uh, Ben Bernanke just in the last week is saying the crisis of October 7th. And it, it's, it, it really, it's woo-woo scary to me sometimes to uh, have an insight into future events that far in advance with that kind of accuracy level. Dates, I'm told, are very difficult. Events are easier to predict than the dates themselves. Cliff, would you agree with that? That's quite correct, yes, there, because the event is described at an archetype level that's very broad. So, for instance, at a very top level, the times we are in we think of as being epic. That is to say, for the next 15 or 20 years, people are going to be going through stuff that later on other generations will devote monuments to. And that top level drives everything else, and it's easier to see than a specific date for the epic period to start. So it's kind of like the uh, astrological kinds of things where, you know, are the planets really aligned on this day at this moment, or if you shift it over here, would it be ever so slightly different, that kind of a thing. One of the things that you both predicted the, through uh, through the WebBot programming was a huge earthquake would hit the Pacific Northwest. And again, uh, the dates were December 10th to the 12th of 2008. Take the dates out for a little bit. Do you still think that's going to happen? Actually, the language was fulfilled not in the Pacific Northwest, but on the Chilean coast. 
So uh, to, ex- to, to that extent, I'm sure we're going to have very large earthquakes here and probably very soon relative to the eclipse that's occurring today. However, the, no, the language that we had for twin quakes was actually fulfilled by quakes that occurred relative to some volcanoes along the Chilean coast. So it was the opposite end. So we were kind of accurate on the time. It was even on December 11th and 12th. We were just wrong on which end of the planet. I see. Okay. Sorry about it. Missed it by that much. Miss, yeah. Uh, and, and, and we've missed them before in terms of specific locations. For example, uh, I was in the Burbank area building out a recording studio in, I think it was 2005, 2006, uh, October of that year. And we were expecting a quake in the southwest that would be of some considerable magnitude. And that was one of the reasons I left Southern California. Turned out that quake was the big Pakistan quake. And so we got our fulfillment in terms of the uh, number of people killed, displaced, homeless. And the latitude. Uh, and, and the latitude, sure. It, they were both about 34 degrees north. Well, that's Burbank, but it's also where it hit in Pakistan. And so Southwest Asia, Southwest U.S., uh, those kind of descriptors are hard to pull out. Does the software make the prediction, or do you interpret the software and make the prediction? I'd have to say that the uh, data provides um, eye candy, if you will, within the model that attracts me to a particular area of, of data that's been processed. So it's probably universe drawing my attention, and then we root around in there and find out what the words mean. Why does this? Why is there this data blip? So in that sense, the software certainly participates. It's not anything that we particularly generate. And we look for these data blips or bulges within the model. And because they're attractive in hue or color or intensity, uh, we then drill down and find out what's going on. Sometimes it's not worth the trouble to, to have done so, but then other times it yields interesting things like the oh the power outage in the Northeast. We had a whole ton of detail that turned out to be amazingly accurate. Tell me, what would it, it, it say in order for you to uh, ascertain that there's going to be a huge, uh, huge event, maybe a power outage? What kind of verbiage do you pick up? What we initially saw there was the terrorism word. Now, bear in mind, this was, you know, much closer to 9-11 than we are now. Right. And uh, so that popped up, and that was also accurate because everybody in the Northeast instantly thought it was due to terrorism. And we get the idea that our language tells us uh, about the, the words people will use after the event, not necessarily a descriptor from on high about the event itself. So we got terrorism right off, and that drew our eyes there because I had had that uh, signified by a certain intensity in bright yellow. And then within that, it started going instantly to uh, power loss and railroads and, and to the south, a particular location relative to a river. And when we have that kind of level of detail show up at our what we call our tertiary level of support, this third layer of, of data that we process through, then I have a tendency to take it pretty seriously, just like we do when we get archetypes that include human body part references, this kind of thing. One of the things about that prediction in the Northeast, power outage, which was so interesting, was there was a lot of imagery related to an abandoned city. And what's curious is if you look at the switching yard of a power station, the big transformers and the gravel or the asphalt between them almost looks at an archetype level like a big city that's abandoned. And so some of, some of the archetype images uh, come through, but it's very hard to just doing a reverse lookup on a series of, of uh dots in three-dimensional space to look up and say, okay, uh, how does that somehow translate to power transformer switchyard? I, I find this this work that you both do fascinating. Cliff does the work. <laughs> I'm not disagreeing, George. <laughs> he's, he's the engine, huh, George? He's, he's the engine. I, I just happen to be a lucky guy uh, who has a little bit of news sense and can occasionally contribute some content. You massage the, uh, the, the, the results, I guess. Well, George has also uh, provided some interesting theorems and uh, postulates along the way from his perspective that have, in the main, proven to be quite true. In an instance, he was the one who, we have this thing called the Your Postulate or George Postulate, that if we see uh, 